Time to put on your dancing shoes or nightlife outlets will be allowed to fully reopen from April 19th. Get ready for more CDC vouchers that households will receive by the middle of next month. And we look at how some local schools are training the next generation of environmental champions. Good evening, you're watching The Big Story with me, Hairian Diman. Subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you will not miss a single episode. In another big step in Singapore's reopening, all nightlife businesses can operate once again from April 19th. That include bars, pubs, karaoke establishments, discotheques and nightclubs, which will be subject to prevailing COVID-19 rules. An additional measure at establishments where dancing among patrons is one of the intended activities, like at nightclubs, a negative supervised ART will be required before entering the premises. This will be valid for 24 hours, calculated from the time of the test result to the end of the event or activity. Now, how do you feel about this development? Well, let us know in the comments below. All members are now seated within the chamber on the same floor and this marks the first time that members in the 14th Parliament, which opened on 24th August 2020, are able to conduct parliamentary proceedings with all members seated on the same floor. Thanks to new COVID-19 rules, members can once again sit next to each other in Parliament without the minimum one seat distance between them. And according to Speaker of Parliament Tan Chuan Jin, with two sides of the chamber now mixed, MPs can make new friends. Once COVID-19 cases subside in Singapore, Health Minister Ong Yi Kang says authorities will consider easing COVID-19 rules further, which may include reviewing safe distancing rules in FMB settings as well as the need for trace together. MOH no longer rely on trace together for contact tracing for the general public. Cases who self-tested positive and go on the protocol 2 do not upload their trace together data and we rely on them to do the responsible thing, to inform their contacts to self-monitor. So there's really no need to compare the data between self-reporting and trace together because having vaccinated the vast majority of our population and being determined to live with COVID-19, we have passed that stage of the pandemic where we contact trace every case. Having said that, agencies that look after more vulnerable sectors, such as schools or preschools, they continue to use trace together for contact tracing. Further, the aggregated statistics generated by trace together and safe entry can give us a good idea of the settings that are more susceptible to transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Mr Ong says the vaccination differentiated measures and safe entry check-ins are currently still needed as well as 3.5% of the adult population are not fully vaccinated. This group accounts for over one-fifth of ICU cases and deaths. More support is on the way for households given the economic impact of the conflict in Ukraine, which Finance Minister Lawrence Wong says has contributed to a further spike in inflation around the world. And other factors like supply chain issues have led to rising prices. And so he tells Parliament that the government will take immediate actions. Where possible, I will bring forward the implementation of our budget measures. In particular, the $100 CDC vouchers for every Singaporean household will be disbursed by the middle of next month. This is on top of the $100 disbursed four months ago in December last year and will help Singaporeans with their daily expenses. The budget also included rebates for service and conservancy charges, SNCC, and utility bills. We will disburse the first tranche of SNCC rebates and USAFE rebates to eligible households this month. 
the rest of the USAFE and SNCC rebates will be disbursed in the coming quarters in July and October this year and in January next year. Overall, the better way to help Singaporeans cope with the rise in petrol prices, as with inflation in general, is to provide them with the support measures that we have catered for in the budget. Hong Kong will choose a new leader next month after Carrie Lam today announced she will not be running for a second term as chief executive. Mrs Lam says her family takes precedence over everything and they all think that it's time for her to return to them. Leadership contenders now have two weeks to declare their candidacy. They have to secure at least 188 votes from the committee of 1,500 largely pro-Beijing electors who will decide the city's next leader on May 8th. With more is our Hong Kong correspondent Claire Huang. Claire, is it surprising or more like a long time coming given what's unfolded in Hong Kong during Mrs Lam's five-year term? Well, Harinto, um, when the grapevine started buzzing, and that was a long time ago, at least a year ago, more than a year ago, Mrs. Lam was a front runner. Uh, then along the way, there were other people's names that were floated. You are looking at former Chief Executive Leong Chun Ying, that was her predecessor. Uh, and, uh, you know, further down, it was former World Health Organization Director General Margaret Chan. And then there was uh, also Financial Secretary Paul Chan, uh, whose name was also mentioned. And then of late, uh, the Chief Secretary uh, for Administration, John Lee's name, uh, popped up next to Mr. Paul Chan. So at that time, Mrs. Islam was not completely ruled out yet although there were uh, some specific media, local media, that uh, indicated as much. Um, the belief uh, is that Mrs. Lam's handling of the COVID-19 situation uh, might have uh, snuffed out any chance uh, she had. So at some point, I think we, if you do a recap of her term so far, you know, uh, it has been marked by, uh, you know, things like the 2019 unrest, it has been marked by US sanctions, uh, the rollout of the national security law, the electoral system reform. Um, these are all things that were not, most of them were not, uh, you know, uh, popular with uh, Hong Kongers. Now, uh, there is a school of thought that uh, the only logical uh, conclusion is then to get a fresh person, a new person in now that these things have been settled so that the next chief can start from a clean slate. I'll just touch uh, about the potential candidates in just a bit, uh, Claire. But what I want to know is what would Mrs. Lam's exit uh, mean for Beijing's influence on Hong Kong? Well, uh, some observers have uh, pointed out that, uh, you know, her exit is a sign that Beijing wants stability uh, and more control over the city. So in the past few months, right, uh, a thing that was uh, uh, brewing, uh, the undercurrent was that, uh, and it's been a colourful past few months, uh, were the uh, growing uh, criticisms of Mrs. Lam from people within the pro-establishment uh, camp. Uh, the voices were getting louder and louder, um, and they were more and more, uh, as they got more and more unhappy, of course, her handling of the pandemic added to that, uh, they became more public with their criticisms um, from the pro-establishment camp, and it signals a divide amongst this camp. And uh, some of the lawmakers, you know, are believed to, you know, not uh, not be very cooperative with her. Local media is reporting that the government's uh, number two official, John Lee, is the front runner to become the next chief executive. Uh, Claire, what can you tell, uh, tell us about him? Well, um, the top possible candidate uh, at the moment is the city's current number two, uh, John Lee, uh, whose last post was uh, security chief, and then he oversaw the coordination of the different disciplines and auxiliary forces during the uh, 2019 unrest. A little bit about his background. So uh, 
he is from uh, he he hails from a police force you know background and he rose up the ranks of the years uh, he's the kind of candidate that Beijing uh, will want if the priority is stability no foreign interference uh, and you want a strong firm hand uh, as it is there are some observers who think that uh, it could mean more arrests to come if he takes over uh, but there are others who point out that uh, you know uh, with Mr. Lee he can get uh, he'll be able to form a strong government and you know he can keep Hong Kong safe he'll be able to push through policy reforms uh, that Hong Kong needs. Claire thank you so much for the insights our correspondent Claire Huang in Hong Kong. Four schools in Singapore are currently piloting an eco-stewardship program that aims to nurture the next generation of environmental champions. It's something that parents can also participate in and help their child with. Here's Kimberly Zhao's report in partnership with the Ministry of Education. In Mito School, education about the environment permeates all aspects of school life from the time pupils enter Primary 1. This includes a farm-to-table program where students grow mushrooms and plant vegetables hydroponically, with half their harvest sold in the canteen and the other half donated to an elderly home, as well as a recycling drive every Wednesday. So for our weekly recycling program, our students are all given a recycling bag which they can put at a recycling corner at home. So from there, they will bring it on every Wednesday to contribute to our weekly recycling program. So what they do is that when they come down, they actually they sort out the different recyclables, learn more information about it, they bring it back home to share with their parents how it is done. And the data that we have collected from the recyclables, we actually share every uh, Wednesday morning. Our aim is actually to reduce, to make them aware of how much that they are using. So at the end of the day, the data is to, for them to cut down on their usage. I am the head environment champion and environment champions are a student leader who advocate on environment. We create awareness, we make uh, posters and then we paste it uh, all around the school. I was exposed from young to do simple recycling projects uh, such as creating a recycling corner in my house. I was also inspired uh, by my mom. She brought me to different events and exhibits held by Tsuji Foundation Singapore and I saw many of the teachers there are helping the environment. As part of the Singapore Green Plan 2030, MOE plans to work toward a two-thirds reduction of net carbon emissions from the school sector by 2030, aiming for at least 20% of schools to be carbon neutral by then. Under MOE's eco-stewardship program, green infrastructure was introduced in Tampanese Secondary School. Energy-efficient LED lights, ceiling fans and solar panels on the school's roof reduce its carbon footprint. The solar panels are really a very powerful tool for our students to learn about renewable energy. So when we talk about carbon footprint and we talk about renewable energy, we can actually show them the infrastructure in the school. And then they can understand how this can actually be used to support the energy consumption in our school. And when we actually extend the learning and talk about BCA, uh, Building and Construction Authority, and what they are doing in the other parts of Singapore. The kids can connect the language and it gives them that sense of pride and they want to know more because they've seen it very close in their line of vision. I think it's really interesting that my school is making so much effort to be more environmentally positive. So I feel like a lot of youths, though they know how severe climate change is right now, they think that uh, a, small, a small change in their lifestyle is not going to make a difference because it's just one person. But I, don't, I feel like they really underestimate the power of the influence their habits can have on others. Sometimes people don't start because they think they must do something big. But we want to actually say that it's not big, it's about that movement. I, I think that would be I think more enduring and hopefully more sustainable in the long run. You can read more about how schools are training the next generation of environmental stewards in our Smart Parenting section online. Check it out at str.sg forward slash smart parenting.
A quick look at other headlines between last Friday and Sunday evening, the first weekend of Singapore-Malaysia land borders fully reopening. Over 176,000 people cleared the checkpoints. 56,000 came here from Malaysia. And I was one of 120,000 travellers who made the trip across. The roads have been relatively clear, but more people are expected to travel in the coming days, as many are holding out to see how procedures are handled on the ground. According to the latest update from the Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, Singaporeans who apply for a new passport may, might need to wait for about a month due to overwhelming applications. ICA notes that some 6,000 applications are reaching the authority each day, triple the pre-COVID-19 average two years ago. And the big winners at the Grammy Awards on Sunday night, John Batiste taking home five trophies, including the top prize of Album of the Year. 19-year-old Olivia Rodrigo collecting three awards, including Best New Artist. And the R&B supergroup Silk Sonic winning in all four categories it was nominated in, including Record of the Year. Well, congrats to all the winners. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Harianto Diman. See you tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.